When you go out and you buy a value add deal or an expansion, conversion, ground up development, the investors in the debt that you initially place on that type of asset is not the investors in the debt that you want on a long term hold strategy. Welcome to Truly Passive Income. I'm Neil Henderson. And I'm Clint Harris. And I'm Levi Hemingway. Well, we are pleased as punch to have my good friend on here, uh, Fernando Angelucci. He's the CEO of Self Storage Syndicated Equities. Fernando is a seasoned investor who transitioned from engineering to real estate, scaling his business to over $220 million in self storage investments. Uh, that may be out of date uh, as of today, but we'll ask him. He's a global traveler. He's leveraging income arbitrage while running his operations seamlessly across multiple countries. Fernando, welcome, my friend. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. So I first met Fernando at a self-storage mastermind on raising capital in Las Vegas, Nevada, which was my hometown, not his hometown uh, at the time. Uh, and I first interviewed you on my old podcast in February of 2019. Uh, and then I interviewed you again in November of 2020, and that was our most listened to episode ever. Uh, so yeah, congratulations. <laughs> so I, I've got a quick story about Fernando. We, we were at this mastermind in 2018 on self-storage investing. At the time, Fernando was uh, doing wholesaling. He was doing Airbnb arbitrage, uh, just a mover and shaker, but he just bought his self first self storage facility, but he's still kind of learning the ropes. And we're, there's a whole bunch of us there. Paul, well, uh, Paul Moore was there from Wellings Capital. We're all kind of like learning about self storage. And my experience of Fernando was, it was sort of like, we're all standing there going, wow, this self storage thing is really cool. And then we all turned around and there was this cloud of dust of Fernando going off to buy like nine self storage facilities in the next two years. That That's pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, first yeah, year, exactly. uh, first year we bought one. The second year we bought eight. Uh, the next beer we bought another twelve. So it's been scaling up ever since. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I, I can't wait to talk about that. In fact, because of your story and your background, uh, we brought in Levi. So Levi Hemingway's founder of Nomad Capital, along with his dad, one of our general partners, a construction background, does an unbelievable job. And it's one thing to listen to a podcast and get a lot out of it. And a lot of times we do that and people in the office will listen back to podcasts that we recorded. It's something else to be there live and be able to ask questions and dig in. So we're excited to have Levi here with us as well. So thanks for making room for us. And uh, Fernando, let's talk about velocity here. Like you, you just yeah. went from one and then you went to eight. What are we talking about here? Like I've where is this capital coming from? How did you solidify a business plan that fast and put systems and operations in place to create that kind of velocity? Yeah, great question. So I'm I'm sure you've heard me parrot this before and so many people have. There's this wonderful book called Traction by Gino Wickman that helps you basically create an operating system for your company. Because what we notice is a lot of business owners or when they're starting out, they're just kind of flying by the seat of their pants. And that's what causes you to get bogged down because you're not actually focused on working on the business. You're too busy working in the business. So how do we start delegating and elevating from the roles that are below our, say, hourly rate as a CEO uh, so that we can scale? So 2016 to 2018 is when I saw the writing on the wall. Um, decided to get out of any habitation-based real estate. I didn't want anybody living inside of my investments and just caused too much liability, too much uncertainty. And then with kind of the political climate, we've seen this growing trend where the government is inserting themselves into housing as a you know necessity uh, and capping rents, uh, not allowing you to collect rent as we saw in uh, you know, during the, the COVID pandemic time. But at the same time, those landlords, they still had to keep paying their mortgage and they still had to keep paying their property taxes. So they were, they were the ones that were losing. So decided to exit our residential portfolio over that two-year process and then switch into self-storage. The very first thing that I do anytime I go into a new asset class is I run it myself before getting third-party managers, before getting consultants, because I need to know that the people I'm hiring are actually hitting metrics that are reasonable and not just kind of phoning it in, right? And if you never run your own self-storage facility, you don't know if your property manager is doing the appropriate thing. Same thing, uh, Levi, with you know the construction side. If you've never GC'd your own project, you don't know if your GC is, is doing the right thing or if your CM is doing the right thing. So after about six months of running our first facility, 
which was, you know, it's close to us, uh, maybe a two hour drive in really bad Chicago traffic. Um, we figured out, okay, we set up the system. We treated this facility as if we had to jump on a plane to go see it. And that allowed us to start looking into other states that were more favorable for running businesses. So we left Illinois and then we started doing things in Indiana, Iowa, uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, the, you know, the really good states for self storage. At that point, you know, we very quickly ran out of our own capital. And that's when we realized, hey, we actually need to run a whole separate business. And that entire business is just a capital raising business in and of itself. It needs its own set of staff. It needs its own set of fulfillment, its own marketing. And that's what really helped us go from, you know, the first couple handful of deals to scaling up to, you know, over $230 million of storage in less than six years. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, congratulations. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I love that. I mean... Um, first of all, I, lo I love the shift from, you know, your journey from the asset class you were in to, you know, tenants occupying your, your space, um, and seeing a lot of risk in that, right. There's, mm -hmm. um, obviously it's, it's a needed asset class, but, um, but I like that forward thinking that, that, you know, I, I want to be able to control, um, I don't want other people to be able to control my business. Um, and so, um, yeah, con congratulations on that. That's an incredible journey. We also, so when we started Nomad Capital, we read traction as well um implemented it and um that has been a huge um game changer for our business um you know we operate our level 10 meetings and and all that good stuff off of it um but yeah it, it gave us a lot of structure to hey let's 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 put in the systems to scale this um you know and let's look let's look forward a few years um yeah. and so yeah traction was a huge part of um i feel like our growth and success as well so it's funny, I had a, a similar background. So I was doing Airbnb uh, arbitrage, using that to get money to buy small multifamilies and convert them to Airbnb. We're in Wilmington, North Carolina. So I live down at Carolina Beach right down the road. And I got completely burned out on tenants. I was like, man, and most people, instead of having one tenant a, a month in a property, I've got eight to 10 tenants a month and they're multifamily property. So it's a, it's a bunch of quadplexes and a duplex. And I just got to the point where I was like, man, I replaced my income and I achieved a level of financial freedom, but I did not get time or location independence. The difference is, Fernando, you're a global world traveler. And I was stuck there with a phone in my pocket answering questions, right? So right. I had to make the switch. And when I asked, I looked around, I said, what are the three asset classes that the successful people in that are living the life that I want? It was three things. It was hard money lending and note lending. It was mobile home parks and it was storage. Well, I didn't have any money to lend. I had no interest in mobile home parks because I was already burned out on tenants and that left storage. And I was like, there's no kitchens, there's no bathrooms. I'm renting someone a box of air. That's amazing. So when you got in, I would, it was a very good time. Tell me about the type of assets that you were going after, where you're raising your capital from and what kind of deal structure have you put together or did you put together then and has that evolved over time? Yeah, it, it has definitely evolved. Um, you know, like anything, you, you first have to go through the motions to understand, hey, is this the right way to do it or is this the wrong way to do it? And then you start leveling up the people around you and you start seeing how they're, you know, say raising capital or structuring deals. And that gives you insight on where you'd want to go if you want to go to that level. So when I, we first started, like I said, we started with our own capital and strategic joint venture. So it was all GP money, basically. There was no LPs involved. Um, then very quickly, we ran out of that GP money and we realized, hey, we don't need to give away so much ownership to have a you know team of nine owners on a deal that are all active. That's just unnecessary. So very quickly, we decided to start scaling up. And with that came the need to start raising you know limited partner capital. And there's kind of a, a couple levels that you hit that I always tell people when you're starting out in the capital raising game. First, you know, you hit your your friends and family. These are the people where they don't really care about the deal. They know, like, and trust you, and they're going to invest in you, not the deal. Once you get experience with those folks, then you start going to the friends of friends and friends of family that heard about you at the dinner table or somebody else was chatting about a deal they're invest with you. Very quickly, those people also tap out, right? It's, unless you're in some very affluent circles, which I was not, uh, you tap out of that money very quick. But you use those two levels to build up a really good track record, open and close some deals. And when I say open and close, it means, hey, you've raised the money, then you've 
completed the business plan, plan and you've given the money back. So it, it is not deals in process, it's deals that have already closed and show a, a proven track record. Then you take that and you start going to the retail investors. These are going to be your high net worth, uh, you know, even potentially other business owners, other even real estate investors. I had a lot of real estate investors in different asset classes that wanted ex, uh, exposure to self-storage. Those guys, they don't know you. They may not like you right now. You know, that's part of the marketing strategy that you have to put forward. But what they can look at is here are true deals that have been open and closed. Here's the return rates. Here's supporting documentation that shows this is all legit, right? Then you can start raising capital to, for, for, from those guys. But where do you find those people, right? You can do it the hard way, which is, you know, word of mouth, setting up one on one meetings. That's extremely difficult. We, instead of doing a uh, you know, push marketing campaign, we kind of do more of a pull marketing campaign. We want them to come to us. So one of the very first things we started to do is a multi-channel marketing approach using podcasts as the base foundation. Do a one long format po podcast like we're doing right now, one hour, two hours, three hours, what have you. Then you, you clip, you know, obviously the, the long format stuff is going to go on YouTube un unedited or uncut. But then you clip that one to three hour podcast into small bite sized portions for the social media world. So, you know, TikTok, 30 seconds or less. Instagram, one to three minutes, photos, uh, uh, quotes. Uh, you have Facebook and LinkedIn, which can go a little bit longer format, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And then you have YouTube, of course, right? You use all that to funnel all of the backlinks back into your website where there is a deal portal. In that deal portal, you want to have some exclusivity. So, you know, if somebody wants to see your deals or wants access, they don't just get access right away. When they first request access, they have to schedule a phone call to talk with me in person so I can vet them out to see if they're the appropriate type of investor. Because, you know, people think that all money is good money. That is not the case, what I found out. There is capital that is just not worth your time and not worth your headache. It's that 80 20 principle, right? 20% of your capital is going to cause 80% of your headaches. I'm the expert. I'm the one that knows how to do self storage. If you are not a self storage operator you're in, and you're you know calling me every day trying to tell me what I should and shouldn't do on this deal, I'm not the sponsor for you because clearly you think you know more than me, so you shouldn't be giving me money. You should go do it yourself. So you know, I see you guys smiling and looking at each other. You know, it's hard sometimes, but I have fired investors. I have called them and said, you are not worth my time. And I literally wired their money back after a couple months being like, here's plus whatever time of money. You know, it's just not worth it. Because like you said, I don't want to create, we're business owners. We, the whole reason we're doing this is so that we can do what we want with whom we want whenever we want. If we're just creating another job for ourselves, then we're not doing a service to ourselves and our loved ones. Right. So, that strategy of using the podcast, breaking the part into bite-sized pieces that goes across social media, every one of our one-hour podcasts, we can break into roughly 700 pieces of media content that can be consumed. So I'm still, you know, if you look at my social media channels, there's still stuff that's coming out from podcasts I was on a year or two ago because we just have so much that is coming out. So that helps with the marketing game. But then the great part is, Remember, we were talking about that, hey, do they maybe like you? Do they maybe trust you? It's funny because once you have, when you're crowding the internet with everything about you, your past, your history, your friends, right? Your, your, your strategies, by the time that investor gets onto that phone call with you, I can't tell you how many times they've already jumped on the phone. It's like, Fernando, this is crazy. I know we've never talked, but I feel like I already know who you are because my whole story, my whole history is all over the internet. Just type in Fernando Angelucci into Google, and there's literally hundreds of hours of content that you can watch that you can get to know who I am from a personality basis and from a strategy basis. So that helps. That's usually where most people stop, and I don't blame them. Um, you can use, if you want to get to the next two levels up, you can use those retail investor experience to get into the you know, sub-institutional and institutional worlds. The difference is the retail investors, they are people that are extremely busy. They have some money that they want to invest, but they don't have unlimited funds, right? But they're willing to allow you to structure the deal in a way that makes sense to you and makes sense to the deal. Once you jump from the retail investors to say like the sub-institutional world, which I would consider family office capital, family offices are 
you know, typically a wealthy family that had some type of liquidity event. Let's say they sold a manufacturing company for $300 million. And now they're like, what do I do with this money? So usually what they'll do is they'll hire an in-house investment team, or they'll join what's called a multifamily office, where it's multiple high net worth families that are all using the same investment team to invest on, the, on their behalf. Now you have people that, um, how do I put this in a proper way? The, the golden rule. He with the gold makes the rules. And because they have the ability to cut a check to cover your entire equity stack, they now demand much more favorable economics in their side. Basically, where you're taking all the risk and they're taking all the profit. And then one step above you know, the family office, the uh, registered investment advisors, RIAs, and the small wealth management groups is your truly institutional capital. And to get to that, you need 20 plus years of open and closed deals, basically never losing money, basically never going below projected returns. And these are going to be your pension funds, your sovereign wealth fund. Literally, countries are investing with you, right? That's a little bit harder for our space and self storage because those types of guys, they want to cut a one hundred million dollar check, but they don't want to be over twenty five percent ownership of the capital stack. So you know, it's unlike multifamily where you can go do a four hundred million dollar multifamily deal. There's no four hundred million dollar self storage deals unless you you know build up a portfolio. So. The problem, and then again, once you go up to that, that truly institutional level, then the economics are way in the favor of the LPs and, and out of the GP side. So what we have found is that we like to float in between that you know, retail investor. Obviously, we still have friends and family that invest. And then kind of the lower end of the sub-institutional, smaller family offices, anything less than say like $500 million assets under management. Those are the typical people that we find. They let us be the experts. They allow us to have you know, some participation in the upside while we're taking the risk. They may even be strategic partners, signing on debt with us, things like that. Fernando, a lot to unpack there. Yeah, so much to unpack there. Um, can you walk us through your early years there when you started that transition, right? You went from one facility the first year, eight facilities, and then 12 facilities, right? So you're obviously you're having to source capital and you're going through those motions, you know, the, the friends of friends and family and then the friends of friends. Um, get, shed some light on those early years when you didn't have that track record yet. Like, you, you yeah. know, you're building out the track record. So you bought these right. assets, they're performing They're you know, you're increasing the rents, you know, you're cutting expenses, you're, you're building out the business plan mm -hmm. and yet you're still raising capital for the next deals. So how were you able to overcome maybe some of those objections from investors that said, hey, here's a guy who um, is newer to the self-storage space. Yeah. Um, you know, he's doing the business plan, but he hasn't completed the business plan yet. You know, expand on that as much as, or as little as you can there, but help us unpack yeah. those challenges you had and how you maybe um, were strategic or overcame them. Yeah, Levi, great, great question. So there's kind of two things here. First is using your track record from the other asset classes, right? So what I would tell people is just because this is a new asset class doesn't mean I'm not a good business owner. I'm not a good business builder. It's all the same concept. It's just a different box. So I'm still going to go out and get third party you know, feasibility. Uh, I'm going to bring in vendors that have a lot more experience than me. So in the beginning, a lot of my deck would be like, look at my team. Look how amazing my team is. And I'm just the one that quarterback the team together, right? And then I could also point, hey, here's all the single family deals, all the multifamily deals we did. Here's all the hard money and fix and flip and Airbnb, et cetera. The second thing is when we truly got into, let's say the shift from, you know, buying cash flowing assets is buying cash flowing assets, right? If you're buying a multifamily or self-storage, for the most part, underwriting is pretty much the same. You can find vendors that are pretty much the same to do feasibility for you, et cetera. The big shift for me on kind of building the team is when I went into ground up development. I have never built a three story class A ground up development deal before. Um, the closest I did was single family homes. That's you know literally an order order of magnitude smaller. I'm you know buying a house for two hundred fifty, putting one hundred fifty in, as opposed to me buying a piece of land for one point three and putting twelve million in. Right, way different economies of scale here. Uh, so that is when I decided actually to do a strategic joint venture. So I actually brought in a mentor of mine who had you know, multiple years experience, specifically in the ground up development space as well. And then when I went to go raise capital, I said, 
look at my partner. Look at ama- how amazing his track record is. Or even better, if you want to obs- obfuscate it a little bit, you say, here is the track record of the entire team when 95% of it is from your friends. So this is something that I learned. Uh, the colloquial term for this is borrowing credibility. So it's something you can do. And I, I, you know, I teach people how to do self-storage for free. I don't charge for classes or anything, but I always say, listen, if you ever come across a deal that maybe is too big for your britches, give me a call. I'm more than happy to lend my balance sheet, my liquidity, and my track record to help you get financing and help you get um, equity on that. So it was a very interesting um, transition, but it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. The harder transition was going from the friends and fr- family to the retail investors that you have no experience with. You know, we, we at Nomad, we talk a lot about, and I've heard you talk about this as well, about sort of the four buckets, the four strategies of self storage, which is you've got the operational turnaround where you're just buying an existing facility that's maybe mom and pop, it's maybe mismanaged. Uh, and, and you're, you know, it's a, a little, uh, it's a lighter lift, probably not as great a return. Uh, and then you've got the expansion opportunity. It's it's low, uh, a lower level value add. You're buying an existing facility. It's already cash flowing, uh, and you're but it's got some extra land. You're able to build another building. And then you've got conversions, which I think you've also done as well. That is mm-hmm. that's our bread and butter. Uh, and then you've got the uh, then you've got straight up ground up development. And you, mm-hmm. as if I recall, you've done all four, correct? Correct. And I would actually add one fifth strategy to that. And you got to realize it's all a tool belt, right? You have these leads that are coming in. You want to monetize every lead. Just because it's not a good deal for you doesn't mean it's not a good deal for someone else. So then you lock those up under contract and you wholesale them to other people. And that re-ups your coffers for down payments, for pursuit costs, for marketing dollars. So I'd say there's actually five strategies. We're taking that one. I need a pen. <laughs> we, we, that's come up in conversation so for, much like, over the last couple months because we're you know, these are development deals for us, right? So it takes a year to build it out. Then it's going to take a couple of years to get it stabilized. So there's this void where the investors are earning a backhoe preferred return, but there's no cash flow coming in, right? So right. how do we recapitalize? That's that's a conversation that that has come up a lot. So we may be picking your brain about that off on on another call as well. Sure. Um, I want to talk about the way that that you have moved forward with your portfolio because you've had some exits. You've had some large exits. Yeah. And a lot of our mentality is that self-storage is a great asset for a long-term hold. It's very inflation resistant, pandemic resistant, uh, you know, recession resistant. What really matters is about a seven mile radius. So you can find these little micro economy pockets that you just really want to hold forever. Yeah. Um, but the reality is a lot of times with the operational turnaround or whatever you're doing, there's so much equity in the deal that you can't access that at some point it likely makes sense to have a liquidity event, either cash out refinance if the market's right, but more likely a sale, right? So talk to me about you went from one facility, then eight and then 12, and you sold a large portion of the portfolio at one point in time. Talk to me about your mindset when you're looking Mm -hmm. at a property as to what you think the best thing is to do with that property and also, how did things change for you after you sold your first property in terms of your relationship with investors? Yeah, great, great question. So, Clint, the way I look at this is you got to look at your cost of capital. Okay. So, yes, self storage is a great long term hold asset, but the capital you have underneath it, the ones that you use to get through the value, you know, we're not buying stabilized deals. You and us, you know, we're not, we're not some, money bags, life insurance companies that's just buying four caps because it's more stable than investing in the stock market. So when you go out and you buy a value add deal or an expansion conversion, ground up development, the investors in the debt that you initially place on that type of asset is not the investors in the debt that you want on a long-term hold strategy, right? Typically, if you got a value add or, or some type of construction on the debt side, you're looking at floating rates. So now you got risk from an interest rate perspective. And then the investors that go into those types of deals, they're looking for, you know, double digit returns. They're looking for, you know, anywhere between mid, mid teens all the way up to low 20s, depending on the risk of the project. 
those type of IRR numbers are not sustainable for a long-term hold. So you have two options. You can either refinance into some permanent debt, like a, say a 10-year CMBS loan or even longer-term life insurance loan. And then the equity that you have on that, if you still need to retain equity, you need to move more towards like the coupon clipper style investors. These are like going to be your your DST investors that they ran out of time on their 1041 or 1031. They're okay clipping a 6% coupon per year because it saved them 30% in taxes. That's the type of investor. With that being said, my strategy is we don't really have any long-term hold deals with investors. What I do is I do the the that the forced appreciation play, whether it's any of those strategies, and then typically sell those to realize that equity so that I can eventually go off and buy self-storage facilities uh, with no investors and just debt, or ideally, once I'm you know old and tired and I don't even want to deal with that side, just all cash, no debt, no equity, and just truly just treat it like a cash cow piggy bank, right? And the reason you look at that is if you look at, are you guys familiar with like the Laffer curve or the curve of diminishing returns, right? When, when you look at a deal, especially when you're analyzing it from an IRR basis, internal rate of return, because that's a time-based, time-based value system, you see that after typically on self-storage deals, after about three years on a value add or a small expansion or f- up to five years on a conversion or ground of development, Every additional year that you hold that asset, that return that you're getting is actually much lower than the opportunity cost of taking the equity and investing it into a new value add project where you can push, you know, on a ground up deal, you, you build it for 10 million and in three to five years, it's worth 18. On a stabilized deal, you buy it for 10 million and then in three to five years, it's worth 12 million, maybe, right? Whatever inflation rate is, I guess. So it just doesn't make sense right now to build a a cash flowing long term portfolio for me and the investors that I currently have access to. And the way I describe what you're talking about is you're essentially stacking laugh, laugher curves on top of each other. Or That's hockey perfect. sticks. Perfect. Yes. You know, it's like you got that you got that return that goes up here, and like once it hits that like where it starts, you know, decelerating. Now you just you know. Exit, stack it on top of each other and just keep, you know, keep doing that. Correct. Well, I think, you know, th- this is, a, it can be a very controversial topic, you know, like to sell, to not sell, you know, you see people on Twitter and all these spaces and they're like, man, you know, the only way to create real wealth is to never sell an asset. And, um, and then, you know, of course you have both sides of the fence here. And, um, you know, this is a conversation that we talk about internally because, you know, for us, our background was, you know, my dad, our, our fourth partner is. He comes from, um, you know, a background of developing his own projects and he still holds, holds those assets today. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's a very interesting way of looking at it. That was before we started raising capital um, with Nomad and scaling to what we're doing now. So, you know, part of that strategy is that's what got us here, but will yeah. it get us there, right? Um, right? And so, you know, we ask this question all the time because there is that, that magical day you get a CEO or you open the doors on the next building. I mean, especially for ground up the day you get that, that golden CEO, you know, you've got an appraisal in hand that, that is, you've just created so much value. You've taken so much risk off the table for the next buyer, for the next group, for the bank. Um, and so that's, that's really your, you know, golden ticket or that, that's your CEO that that's, that's where you create so much of the value. So. And Levi, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can run both strategy at the same time. So for example, let's say you, you build up a portfolio of five to 10 assets that you went through the value add process, you sell off nine of them, you use that equity to pay off all your investors, pay off all the debt, and then you keep that 10th one, pay off the investors and the bank, but then keep the asset. So kind of using you know the, the flip five to keep one, flip five to keep one strategy, because in the end of the day, you know, I don't want to be the richest person in the world. I don't want... My biggest thing is I want time freedom. And the only way to have time freedom and truly a low stress life lifestyle is to have no one to answer to. And unfortunately, everyone thinks that as a capital raiser, you're your own boss, but you're not. The bank is your boss and all your investors are your boss. So how do you shift into a way where you can go gallivant around you know, the, the beaches of Brazil 
without having to worry every day that everything's going according to plan. And the easiest way to do that is to slowly start stacking assets that have no debt and no equity. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. So that, that seemed like a good segue. Um, so you've done some deals internationally. Um, talk about international debt, talk about, t- just touch on that a little bit if you can. I mean, that's yeah, so, probably spend a whole, a whole hour talking about just that. Yeah. So just to set the record straight, I haven't done any deals internationally because of the issues that I have found. So we are so lucky to be investors in the United States because of our stable economy, despite what the TV tells you. When you truly see what our economy looks like to literally every other economy in the world, even the other developed economies in the world, like we are one of the most stable foundations across the the entire planet. So for example, we're here complaining that debt is so expensive. And now instead of paying 4% on a ground of development, I'm paying 8% or God forbid, you know, prime 8.5%. But then you go to places like South America, where debt is 3%. And it's not 3% a year, it's 3% a month. And to get that debt, uh, you have to put usually one times the debt amount in cash at the bank. So you need a million dollars? Great. You give us a million dollars in a CD, and you'll pay, you'll pay 24 to 36% on on that debt, right? In addition to that, our inflation now is what, three ish, 4%, still a little high. You have places like Brazil, for example, that if you put your money in a bank account, they pay you 13%. Why do you think they're paying you 13%? You think the bank is losing? No, it's because the inflation there is at least five or six, you know, 100 basis points higher than what the bank is willing to pay you. So we did try to do a deal. We tried to buy the third largest self-storage uh, company in Brazil. It's a new emerging market. Unlike, say, the United States, where one in nine people use storage. In Brazil, it's about one in 100 people use storage. So still trying to change the... Um, you know, As countries come up and become more wealthy, they, they look towards the United States because our biggest exporter is culture. They say, hey, we want to be like Americans, so we want to buy a bunch of shit we don't need, and we want to put it into a box and pay for that box and forget what we had in that box for 10 years, right? That deal just did not work out because of the debt that was required, and then the returns that the equity investors, you're right, you're, you're going to need basically equity investors from that country because trying to pull equity investors from the United States, which is the most stable economy, economy to invest in, to be like, hey, we're going to go into a place where politically... Uh, I don't know, maybe the country decides to take our assets and nationalize them or, you know, this is happening with, I mean, perfect examples. If you look at any like oil company and how they lose billion dollar refineries, Venezuela, Argentina, China, Russia, these are like perfect examples of what happens when you don't have a stable economy that has rules, set rules to play by as an investor. So it's been extremely difficult, but there is a lot of opportunity abroad. Um, the United States has over 90% of the self-storage in the world. Uh, and here it's ubiquitous. I mean, you, you're in the middle of nowhere, podunk town in Iowa or Illinois downstate, and there's, sell, there's three or four self-storage facilities in every city, even if those little towns only have 3,000 people. In other countries, that's not the case. It's always going to be in the, the main financial center. So, for example, Mexico, there's storage in Mexico City basically only. You go down to Brazil, you got Sao Paulo, Rio, Curitiba. That's about it, right? You go to the UK, you got London, you got Paris, maybe. You go up into Canada. It's, they're a little bit more like us, so they already start buying a bunch of shit. Their housing crisis is also really bad, even worse than ours. So they have a little bit more across larger cities. But it's nowhere like the United States where anywhere you go, there is storage literally left and right. Um, but that is a growing, growing area, and the returns are much better. Uh, I'm going to be speaking a lot about Brazil because I've spent a lot of time there recently and have looked into that side of the the world. But for example, Brazil labor labor cost and material cost for anything produced in the country is extremely cheap. I mean, like literally one tenth, if not one twentieth, the cost of the U.S. Uh, minimum wage in Brazil is like hundred and thirty dollars a month, right? So like you're going to get laborers that are willing to work for even less than that. The expensive part, though, is the debt. So, you know, 
you're paying 300% in debt. So that, that's where a lot of your operational costs ends up going. Not so like here in the, you know, the United States, when you're going to go build up a ground up development, half of the cost is labor, right? If not more, depending on what type of building that you're building. Because you can get corrugated steel for 19 bucks a foot, maybe, you know, 18 bucks, depending on how, how nice you're going. So that, that has been super interesting, um, but people have done it. So, you know, the late Sam Zell, Chicago native, uh, he owns the largest self-storage company in Brazil. It's, it's called Guarjiki, which literally means store here. Um, and they're doing, they're doing really well. Hey, Clint, would you quickly share his, your, your Shanghai call with him? <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah. We were talking about international. So I had a really funny event happen. It's probably been two months ago now. So we, we had a fund to fund manager who's been really interested in Nomad that we met at the best ever conference out in Salt Lake. And uh, he's Chinese. He lives in America and he's got like 150,000 people on his Chinese social media following. And he specifically WeChat. travels around. Yes, I think so. So he's he's specifically focusing on finding U.S. operators and trying to raise capital from Chinese investors, give them a chance to invest into his fund that gets invested into U.S. real estate. So I did a webinar with him and scheduled it for, it was one morning here, one night there, something like that. Uh, 900 people on the call. So what I didn't think about is like, okay, I'm doing this hour long presentation, but it turns into two and a half hours because everything I say um, he's got to translate. So every slide I'm speaking and it'd be like, I'll talk about a slide for like a minute. And then he'll say like 10 words. And then I'll talk about a slide for like 10 seconds and he'll go off for five minutes. And I'm like, I have no idea what's being said here. But anyway, we, we, we stumbled through it and the back half of the call, 900 people, we had a Q and a section and I spent an hour. It was like, explaining to these people that self-storage was real. And they, they kept asking the same question over and over. And it was this, it was like, hold on. You're telling me that Americans own a house and then they fill it full of stuff and then they go buy more stuff and then they rent a building to put that stuff into the building. And I was like, yes. And they're like, I don't think you heard me. Hold on a second. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, I do, they're, they're like, why don't Americans just get rid of stuff? And I was like, look, I don't want to be here defending storage. I don't use it myself. We just own it. Like, don't but, you want to hear about the returns? Yeah. yeah. They were, and then they, it was just, you're telling me and it was over and over and over. So this is literally the same conversation I have any, you know, in the last, I don't know, 18 months, I've been in almost 20 countries. And every time somebody asks me what I do and I try to tell them that it's the same reaction, they're like, but why don't they just sell or give away the stuff? <laughs> I know. It's like, because we don't do that here. We're, yeah, shh, 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 shh. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell the secret. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about, we talked your early days, your growth trajectory, everything you've accomplished there, your mindset, using traction to build that system out. Um, how did things change for you um, after you had your first liquidity event and you're looking at that curve and you're deciding, okay, at this point in time, yeah. it's trying, it's, it's time to make a move throughout your career of doing this, where have your bottlenecks been? And, you know, capital raising is really tough right now. Yeah. It was significantly easier a couple of years ago. It's, it's tough right now. Mm -hmm. Um, we just interviewed Travis Watts from Ashcroft capital. And he said that it's about 60% down from where they were able to raise capital just yeah. over the, the last year or two. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of headwinds that we're facing. Was that ever a bottleneck for you? And Absolutely. as you grew, how did it change after your first liquidity event? And now you've got a solid track record of having sold. What was your first sale? Was it a property or portfolio? And how did that change things? Yeah. So uh, I was telling you guys about that first deal I did outside of Chicago and Yorkville. So that was the very first facility I bought. Tiny facility maybe 16,000 square feet, no utilities. So that means there was no lights. There was nothing. It was behind a, a Dunkin' Donuts. It wasn't even fenced. It was like a crazy deal. Um, very quickly built up a, a, a small portfolio of similar small assets. Maybe the largest one was like 32 or 35,000 net rentable square feet. 
I wanted to build this portfolio up larger to get, you know, above that 300,000 net rentable square foot range, um, or even, you know, ideally half a million net rentable square feet to go out to market. But very quickly, um, I, you know, I, I like to track macroeconomics in general. I think everyone that's in real estate should do that because it, it can give you some foresight into the, into the future. And I'd started to see these very, uh, hawkish statements coming out of the Fed and talking about inflation, rip roaring. And I was like, they're going to start raising rates. And someone, something that nobody seems to realize, or at least people that don't track this regularly is you can go download the Fed's dot chart. And it literally, it, it pulls all the state Feds or the, the, the minor Feds and where they think rates are going to be on a quarterly basis for the next like three to five years. And all of a sudden I'm seeing dots go up, 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 up. And I'm like, oh shit. So I was like, I guess we need to sell now. So I went to my partners and I said, guys, it, we need to go. I know not all these deals are completely done with the value add, but we are going to get more money if we sell now at a six cap because of where interest rates are and give up a little bit on value versus selling two years from now at an eight cap, but fully stabilized, right? So that was our first exit. It was a portfolio of 10 properties all in one. Um, and it was, I mean, it was a wild experience to one day just open up your bank account and see, you know, seven plus figures just sitting there. And it's like, oh, this is my portion of the profits, you know, like that feels really nice. Uh, so that's, that's when I actually decided to first Say, hey, you know what? Maybe maybe it's time to start traveling around the world and see if I can do this remotely. Uh, but the better part about that is it allowed me to start raising capital so much faster because I, I had something fresh that came out. I said, here's the track record. Not only did we say, hey, here's what we bought for, here's what we sold, but on each individual deal, we said next to the track record sheet, it said, we bought this deal because of X, Y, and Z. Here's where we saw the value. Here's what actually happened. We bought this deal because it was in a market that was undersaturated and the rents were 60, 60, all the stuff that you put on the capital raising presentation you do, you should also put on the track record sheet once you're done with the deal because it, it helps the investors, the, one, the retail investors get into your mindset and see how do they analyze these deals? How do they mitigate downside risk? How are they going to protect my investment? Not, oh, they just happen to throw some money in the market and made, and they made money on it. You know, the last 10 years in this 0% fed rate economy, you could piss in the wind and make money, right? It was crazy. Like a lot of people that had no business getting into our industry, got into our industry because it was just so the winds were at your back. I mean, you can make money doing basically anything, buy an asset, hold it for two years and sell it and you made a profit. Ridiculous. So having that track record was huge for us. And that allowed us to now go to this list that we had just started cultivating using that social media strategy and just do one quick email blast to everybody. Like, just wanted to update you with, you know, where we've been. We just had a large exit. Here's the exit. We blasted all over our social media. And that started to really open up the wallets to invest into the deals. These were the guys that they were curious to get involved, but they weren't really sold yet on the team or the previous track record with different asset classes. They wanted to see a self storage track record that I did, nobody else, right? Um, so that helped quite a bit, and that allowed us to change our acquisition strategy quite a bit. So before you know, you're you're trying to pick up the stuff when you're first starting out. You know, you have limited funds. You may not have the best relationships as far as uh, you know getting pocket deals or wholesalers bringing you deals. So you you pick up kind of the stuff that nobody wants, the stuff that has a lot of hair on it. It's going to be small. It's going to be hard to sell on its own once you're done with it. Once we got after you know got out after that that ten property sale, now people are bringing us you know thirty five plus fifty plus thousand net rentable square feet stuff that was really good and had an easy exit strategy. This is the thing that I learned, you know, every deal we sell, even if we, we do great, we always do what's called like our post-mortem and we'll say, Hey, let's look at this deal. Like what did go wrong? What can we change in the future? Or if nothing went wrong, what could have gone wrong if say the economy was different instead of selling in, you know, 2021 or 2022, 
what happens if we sold it in, you know, end of 2023 when all the banks were freaking out because, you know, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed and Signature Bank collapsed and there's no way to get debt, right? How are you going to sell deals? And one of the things we realized is there's a lot of deals out there that look really good on paper. You know, you're buying them at a 12 or 13 cap, but you're not looking at how you're going to get rid of this asset. Like who's going to be the buyer? Because you always want to go up one level when you're going to a new buyer. I don't want to sell to other Fernandos because other Fernandos are going to beat me down and do super creative structures that I do, right? I want to go up to somebody on the next level of REIT, for example, where they don't have time to do that. They just want a portfolio. They have much cheaper cost of capital than me. They can buy a deal at a six cap and double their money. Versus if I bought a deal at a six cap and sold at a six cap, I would be losing money because my debt right now is 8%. And my equity is 16 to 22. So my combined cost of capital is like low double digits, right? So I need to really push value. Um, So that was a huge learning curve for us. Um, And as we started progressing through, you know, this changing in the economy, as far as easy money to, you know, making it much more difficult to get leverage, we started to see, like you were talking about um, with Ashcroft, a... Uh, a general um, lack of enthusiasm to invest in equities, especially when the stock market was just exploding. I mean, I think that we saw like the first down day yesterday in like God knows how many months, right? Um, so that was tough. So we ended up pivoting to buying deals that are much easier to get financed and much easier to raise capital from. And so basically what that entails is a deal that kicks off cash flow day one. You got to be able to hit the press, um, but you still want to be able to have that good value add in there. So our sweet spot right now is purchase and expansion deals. If I can buy a deal that is, let's say, thirty thousand plus net rentable day one, but already comes with land that I don't have to rezone, that's a huge slam dunk for us because now we just shorten down the time to get distributions to investors by like 12 to 18 months, depending on how long that zoning process is. And then it also makes it easier to finance because now, you know, back in the day when interest rates were a non-factor, everyone's like, well, what leverage can you give? What leverage can you give? And banks would have a standard answer. Now the answer is like, we don't know what leverage we can give. We have to run a DSCR calc and you have to hit a one or a one, two, five by X date. And whatever you hit by that date, that is what's going to push down your leverage to, you know, sometimes on like these development deals, you're coming to the table with 50% down. Like, and if you have to raise 50% as equity at 16 to 22%, like you're basically working for free at that point. What, what's the point of you even doing the deal? You know, I mean, we can all say that we're altruistic, but we're doing this because we want to support our families as well. So, you know, we, I need to make some profit on these deals as well. So what we found is with these ground up develop or with these uh, purchase and expansion deals, You already have income coming in. That makes it much easier for the bank to underwrite a construction loan. And that income is going to offset the construction financing cost. And when you go to your investors, you say, hey, instead of you having to wait, typically for us, it's three years to get a distribution on a ground up development deal, like 100% ground up. I'd be like, hey, six months, we're done with the expansion. And I'm already able to start kicking out distributions within that quarter. That makes it a lot easier for people to part with their money because they're perceiving the cash flow as less risk. It's already kicking out cash flow. It's you know, the, there's also the story of this facility has been here. It has an operating history, as opposed to when you have to go to a ground up development or conversion. You're like, well, the feasibility says that it's going to cash flow, and these are the rates, but you don't really know, right? You don't hunt. It, everything's just a guess, even if it's a guess from a expert, it's still a guess because there is no true proven track record. So those are the types of deals that have been way easier for us to finance, especially when you start incorporating some creative financing structures on top of that. So most of the deals we've been doing now have some type of seller finance or seller equity contribution to them. Um, If it's a deal that has construction, we say, listen, we can get to the price that you need to be at, but you need to be in the second position behind a construction bank that's going to give us the cash and we'll structure that financing in a way that actually the blended uh, debt service coverage ratio is actually lower. Because if you can get, let's say, a seller to carry back 40% 
you know, so that's not a hard ask. You know, a lot of people think seller finance means you have to go to the seller and ask them to carry 90% of the note. That's hard for a seller to swallow. But if you can say, hey, I can give you 60% of your money today, and then you get to earn interest on your other 40% as the bank to get you even higher profits over the next, you know, three to five years, that's much easier to swallow. But to do that, I'm going to need a pretty good rate. And so if you get a 4% interest rate on the seller finance piece and you have an 8% interest rate on the construction loan above, that blends down, you know, call it to maybe like a 6.2, maybe even the high fives. And now all of a sudden you got deals that pencil really well for distributions for investors, right? So Fernando, this is going to be a two-part episode. So I want to, you know, just say, first of all, thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing, man. Uh, if any of our listeners have listened to this and they want to get a hold of you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah. Easiest way is just to hit me up on my cell phone. Cell phone number is 630-408-8090. I'm much easier to reach via text than call. If that is a little too forward for you, you can always go to our website, which is uh, sssse.com, as you can see in the back here. And that has easy ways to contact me or business partners. Uh, you can see all of our track records, investment portals, all that stuff. Great, man. Thank you. Uh, bold strategy, putting your cell phone out there. Bold strategy. Well, let me, be, bold before, strategy. before you move on, I'll tell you why it's a bold strategy. So there is kind of the, the Apple physiology where if it takes more than two clicks to get to whatever you need on the iPhone, that wasn't allowed to go into the iPhone because they wanted to reduce friction. So let's think about it with our investors. If you got somebody that wants to give you money, do you really want to put a bunch of roadblocks in front of them where they first have to go to your website and they got to schedule a call and then fill out a form and then, you know, whatever, and then confirm like that's too much. Like if, if a guy is ready to invest money, the second they're ready to invest, they're ready to invest that second. They want to reach you that second. They might start getting colder over time. Same thing with sellers, right? So if an investor wants to give you some capital, why not make it super easy for them to reach you? Love it. All right. My cell phone is... <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, listen, thanks for sharing, man. It's been great chatting with you. We'll pick this up on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening and watching the Truly Passive Income podcast. If you liked the show, if you think it would be useful for someone else, the greatest compliment that you could give us would be to share the episode, leave a comment down below, or leave us an honest review. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let us know down below. And remember, with truly passive income comes freedom of time, place, and the freedom to pursue your higher purpose.